Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for the sunny day. We thank you for gathering us together to worship you. May your spirit be with us. Open our mind, open our ears. Let us receive your words. And may all the words from my mouth are all accepted by you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Next slide. Today's passage is about David's affair with Bathsheba. I think most of you have heard this story before. Usually, we focus on David's sin. However, some people blame Bathsheba for tempting David, which is a classic case of blaming the victim. And this happens a lot in Asian countries. When there is a sexual crime, many people blame the women, saying they dress provocatively or tempted the men. Similarly, when men have affairs, people often blame the women as if it's all their fault. This is ridiculous. Let's return to our passage. In verse 1, it says, In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, King David should have been with his troops fighting the Ammonites. But where was David? He stayed in Jerusalem instead of going up with his troops. We don't know the reason. Maybe he was very confident in his army. Or maybe he was just being lazy. In verse 2, we learn that David woke up in the late afternoon. Ah, this might give us a clue about why he didn't join his troops. He woke up late, then walked around on the roof and saw Bathsheba bathing. Remember, Bathsheba was in her bathroom while David was looking down from the rooftop. Bathsheba's bathing is not an act of seduction. And the prophet Laban does not see it that way either. Bathsheba is not blamed. David knew from the start that she was married. He should have been on the battlefield with Joab and the other warriors, not relaxing at home. In verse 4, it's very clear. David sent messengers to get her. In the parable in chapter 12, verse 1 to 4, but Zippa is the lamb, the victim. But Zippa expected David to be with her husband on the battlefield. Instead, David used his power to take the wife of one of his most loyal subjects. The whole affair is a twisted use of royal power. 
the Lareta portrays Basipa as silent and passive. She goes to David, conceives, and only speaks to inform David that she is pregnant. Unlike many interpreters of his time, John Wesley looked in verse 4 that he did not bring Basipa for seducing David but held David fully responsible. John Wesley said, See how all the way to sin is downhill. When men begin, they cannot soon stop themselves. Unlike the brief narration of the affair, David's attempts to cover up his offense are detailed extensively. Uriah the Hittite, listed among David's elite warriors, was likely one of those who supported David in his early years in the wilderness. He had the power to harm David both politically and physically. Uriah was a man impeccable, impeccable integrity loyalty and self-control, shown by his refusal to sleep at home with his wife while his comrades and God's ark was intense. He even resisted David's attempts to loosen him by getting him drunk. Uriah's portrayal highlights David's treachery starkly. Recently, the reader learned of David's loyalty. Ah, yeah. The reader learned of David's loyalty to the grandson of the former king and the son of an ally. Using messengers, now. We see his ugly act of disloyalty toward one of his close supporters. When David learns that Bathsheba is pregnant, he recalls you wire from the siege of Rabbah, the Ammonite capital. David pretends to seek information about the war but his real purpose is to make everyone, especially you wire, believe that when the child is born, it is you wise. The face was your feet in verse 8 is a substitute for having sex with your wife. If you wire has compiled, the affair would never have become public. Also, David planned. But Uriah falls David's scream by chastely sleeping in the servants' quarters. He later explains to David that this is the way of staying loyal to his comrades in the field. David kept asking Uriah to return home. But Uriah continued to refuse, which David did not expect. Remember, Uriah is not even a native Israelite, but a Hittite mercenary, descended from a power race that once ruled much of the land from the Mediterranean Sea to Mesopotamia. Yet, his personal code of conduct is so honorable that unknowingly he repeatedly obstructs David's treachery. Finally, David was not happy and passed a message to send Uriah to death by his royal power. Our 17th assembly has just finished. 
this year. The assembly invited Reverend Dr. Grace Jason Kim as the speaker. I think many of you might remember her from when she visited Australia a few years ago and pitched here at Reverend Sanjay's invitation. She recently published a book called When God Became White. In her book, she mentions that Christianity today is often seen as a white Christianity because the gospel was spread worldwide by European missionaries. As a result, Christianity has been influenced by white culture, which has also introduced a sense of white superiority into the religion. On the other hand, Christianity is often seen as an invasion into Asia because missionaries usually came with colonizers. Asian people often refer to Christianity as a Western or white religion. In reality, Jesus was not white. Jesus was likely brown. These are some facts about how people view Christianity from other cultures, especially Asians. As a result, Christianity can also imply a power dynamic over minority people. The other day, an Anglo member of the Eastwood congregation asked me if I had experienced this kind of white power before, I told him the situation is not serious in Sydney. I am fortunate to be part of the United Church, which is an inclusive community. The people I have met in different United Church congregations are very nice and I don't feel they consider themselves superior. However, we still need to be aware of unintentionally exercising any power over minorities due to cultural differences. Asians tend to be silent and rarely express themselves, even when facing injustice. Since the United Church is a multicultural community, we need to be mindful of these differences. People who are given power must use it to protect and improve the lives of those they lead. God loves everyone. So we need to protect those who are least able to protect themselves and help them live the fullest lives possible. Amen.